there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. It's my uh, privilege to welcome you to the, this morning's worship as we come gathered to uh, praise our God. Uh, can you join me in a word of prayer as we open our service? Lord and Holy Father, we just give thanks for the opportunity to come and gather together to worship you and sing praises to you. We just pray that everything that's done in this service will be glorifying to your name. For we ask in your son's name, Jesus, amen. Oh, uh, quick note, uh, again, silence your cell phones, and uh, for those of you online, uh, 
turn on the video so we can see your smiling faces. Thank you. I'm going to lead our time of worship with a song that was, that's near to my heart. I selected the song for my husband's memorial service 13, is how many years? Yeah, 13 years ago in March. And I, I did it because it's shout to the Lord, because my heart did not feel like shouting. But I knew that it was because of him. He was my, to he was my shelter, and he's my tower of strength. So please join with me as we open our worship this morning with shout to the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to stand. Those of you that can stand, please stand. Feel free to stand. Feel free to sit. Because I think our hearts are full, anyhow. Thank you for the price you pay. 
certainly an amazing God because we're forgiven. dismiss to go to your class yes we do today's scripture reading is from acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 in the first book theophilus i wrote 
about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods when the Father has set, has set upon his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and, to, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you, into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. A reading of God's word. Good morning, friends. It's great to be here together today. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. It's the last time I'm going to say it. <laughs> but this is the season that we're in and trying to keep that constantly before our eyes. Today is actually on the church calendar called Ascension Sunday. I bet not many of us knew that, but it is Ascension Sunday. So we're going to spend a little time in this passage here um, and in the next couple of weeks here in the book of Acts. Now, a lot of really bad sequels get made. And I'm sure you can think of many. You maybe had a, a movie that you really loved, and then they decided to make a sequel, and you were excited but wondering, and then you watched it, and it's just a huge disappointment. The sense that, like, let's make a quick buck off this, even though we don't want to invest any energy, and there's not really even a compelling story to be told. There are exceptions, of course. Godfather Part Two, <laughs> one best film. But personally, for me, I have to say that my favorite sequel is The Empire Strikes Back. It helps that I was 11 years old at the time, and it was fantastic, but I just watched it with my family recently, and I said, that is a good movie. Why is it a good movie? It's a good movie because the original story invited a follow-up. There were questions of what happened next, and what became of these important characters? Well, the book of Acts in the Bible is a sequel. It's a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Now, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You could consider this a sequel to any of them. But really, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts. Even though they're not right next to each other in the Bible, you could see them as part one, part two. They're both dedicated to this uh, person, Theophilus. We don't know who he was exactly, but he is some sort of uh, a, a mentor to Luke, and Luke does all of his research, and he dedicates his book to this guy. So we've spent time in the gospel leading up to the resurrection, and then the story continues on. And I love 
the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts is really our story. It's you and I. It's what this means for us. What does the resurrection mean for us? And the book of Acts shows how in those initial days and first years, this is what it meant to people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the period of 40 days after Easter, which brings us up to about last Thursday, these 40 days are the days that Jesus in his resurrected body spent with his disciples. And what an amazing 40 days those must have been. I wish we had more written about what happened during that time. But Matthew, Mark, I mean Matthew and Peter and John and James, all the disciples basically get to spend this 40 days with Jesus after his resurrection. And it says that Jesus spent that time teaching them about the kingdom. And there was this sense, I have to imagine, of surprise when Jesus then leads them out to this hilltop, gives them a few final words, and then disappears. They were probably thinking, wait a minute, you rose from the dead, you're supposed to be with us, and now you're leaving? What are we supposed to do? Well, this is the introduction to the book of Acts. And just to kind of organize this a little bit, I think that this passage that Irene just read for us really addresses three things. And it's helpful to think of them as the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Yes, the final line of the Lord's Prayer. The kingdom and the power and the glory. It says that Jesus spent this time talking to his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom. And then one of them asks this question. Lord, is this the time when you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, it's helpful, again, for us to know what the kingdom is because the Gospels are all about the kingdom of God. And it's very easy to think of it as something based on our assumptions. Usually, we think of the kingdom of God as heaven. Sometimes it's actually called the kingdom of heaven. Well, his disciples had something different in mind. They were thinking, all right, now that we've got this king, this Messiah, Jesus, the one who is promised, is he going to restore our country? Israel, right there. They had been conquered. They had been enslaved by other kingdoms, one after another. And they were thinking, wow, now that God has given us this resurrected king, is he going to restore our kingdom and maybe even our empire to us? In Jesus, his response seems to kind of evade the question. He says, you know, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. And it might seem to really blow it off, but really Jesus is all about the kingdom. He spent this whole time talking to them about the kingdom. But they, and oftentimes we, don't really get it. What is this kingdom? On the one hand, we can think of it as uh, an earthly kingdom, an earthly government under God's rule, what's known as a theocracy. Or over on this other side, we can say, this is where we go when we die. It's out there somewhere. But really, neither of those accurately, completely captures it. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God as the place where God's will is done, where God rules. And that's how it is in heaven, but that's not where it's going to stay. That kingdom is invading the earth. And it's invading our world through Jesus and now through Jesus' followers. Jesus wants to see his kingdom become reality. And that's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is all about the kingdom, but the kingdom is going to be something 
different than maybe what we think or assume it's going to be. A lot of Christians live their lives just trying to get through this so that we can go to heaven, because that's where real life is going to begin. But Jesus is saying, you know what? Actually, the kingdom is for this world, and it's going to continue on for eternity. So it's in this place, in this world, that we're really called to invest ourselves, to put our attention, where God wants to bring about change, where God wants to see lives put under the lordship, the love and authority of Jesus Christ. It begins in our hearts, but it doesn't stay in our hearts. It moves out into the world around us. Each one of us is an ambassador for Jesus Christ, right in the place where we're at. Whatever your job is, or wherever you live, whoever the people are that you interact with, certainly your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, the people that you choose to reach out to, all of these are what we might think of as your mission field because the kingdom of God is active and it's on the move and God is working it out in the world around us. Jesus is all about the kingdom, which is interesting because he's leaving in this story. He's talking about the kingdom, and then a few moments later, we see that he's lifted up and taken away. So which leads us to the next thing. We have the kingdom, and then Jesus talks about the power. The power. He says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, this is a new idea for these disciples. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon them. Now, they probably thought of the Holy Spirit as something that came upon the great prophets who had lived in the past. Think of someone like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah. These people in the past who had spoken God's word and sometimes done great deeds, those were the people that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, rested on. Not just on them as ordinary people, fishermen, former tax collectors, and things like that. But, as we'll see, and you have to come back next week for this, in chapter 2, we have what's known as the day of Pentecost, or the birth of the church. Without giving too much away, the Holy Spirit shows up. But that's 10 days later. Here, Jesus is telling them that it's going to happen that there is going to be this amazing bestowal of power upon these ordinary men and women. And it's going to result in an explosion, an explosion of the church, we'll see, because suddenly, from a hundred or so followers of Jesus, in one day there's 3,000. The word that Jesus uses in Greek here is actually dynamis. Dynamis is the word for the power they're going to receive. Of course, the word where we get dynamite. There is going to be an explosion because of the power that Jesus sends to his followers. Now, Jesus has already said to them, you know what, I'm going to be with you always till the very end of the age. Jesus is sending his spirit, and Jesus is present with his followers through his spirit. This is the mystery of the Trinity, which I won't try to explain to you right now. But Jesus and his resurrected body, his physical presence, he's there in person. But when he departs, his spirit will come without any limitations and will be with each one of us who gives our lives to him. Now, the power, when we speak about power, Jesus shows a kind of power which is very different from the power that the world has. When the world thinks about power, it's usually power over people, power to get people to do what we want them to do, to dominate them or coerce them. But the power of the Spirit is really the power to follow Jesus, to live as he lived, which is sacrificially, serving to do what we couldn't do on our own. The work of the kingdom is often the work of peacemaking, the work of reconciliation. It's hard work. As I said, it's sacrificial work. And you know what? If we try to do it on our own, 
we're gonna run out of steam really, really fast. I kind of think of it like batteries. A lot of us now have rechargeable batteries. So I use them for lots of tools. So if I'm out in my uh, garage and I'm doing some kind of work and I'm using drills and saws and things, those batteries are really nice. But then all of a sudden the tool stops working because the battery has run out of energy. The battery in itself is not a source of energy. The battery is just holding the energy that comes from somewhere else. So it's really much better if I'm using a table saw to plug it into the wall to the actual source of energy and have that flowing through. We are like batteries. We're gonna run out of energy. We can't do it on our own and God is not calling us to do it, to go out and change the world, to bring about the kingdom on our own energy and our own conviction because we will run out of energy. We need to be plugged in. Jesus also used this metaphor of vine and branches, that branches need to be connected to the vine in order to have life. Once they're detached, they can't just generate their own life. Pretty soon, they die. The power that Jesus wants to give us is his own presence with us. That's the source of our power. And the purpose of the power is that you will be, as he says, you will be my witnesses. You will go out into the world and you will live for me. You will represent me. You'll be my ambassadors. You'll be my witnesses. You'll show what life in God's kingdom looks like. And you'll do it, and he lists this ever-widening circle. You'll do it right where you're at. For them, it was Jerusalem. And he says, and then you'll do it in Judea, which is like your whole region. And then you'll do it in Samaria, which is the other side of the tracks, those people you don't like. You'll do it with them. And then you'll live this out to all the world. All those people who are unlike you, people that you don't even know yet. This is where God's kingdom is heading. It will touch the whole world. Everyone, the gospel for everyone, and the kingdom is available to all people, starting with the small group of disciples and expanding ever outward. Well, this leads us to the third thing that this passage is about, and that is not just the kingdom, the power, but the glory. Verse 9 says this, when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. This is really odd. Jesus, it says, is suddenly, as he's talking to them, lifted up, and then he disappears into a cloud. We don't know how high up he was when the cloud took him away. The whole thing, again, takes a bit of imagination. Far enough up that they all were standing there, gaping up into the sky, when suddenly two angelic beings appeared and said, what are you doing? Why are you staring up in the sky? This Jesus who just left, he's going to come back in the same way. In the meantime, don't just spend your life staring up into the sky. Get busy. Get busy with what he has told you to do. Well, what are we to make of this, what we call the ascension? Jesus is lifted up. First of all, just a very simple question. Where did he go? Where did Jesus go? Where is he right now? His spirit is with us, but where is his physical, resurrected body? Well, throughout the New Testament, it tells us that Jesus is actually seated at the right hand of God the Father, that he literally went to heaven. Now, there's a sense that heaven is up there somewhere, but heaven not being a 
physical place, almost more of a different dimension. Somehow, Jesus is taken there. But Scripture is very clear that Jesus is reigning in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Now again, is Jesus literally seated at the right hand of God? What's significant about that? Once when I was going to the beach with some friends in high school, we were getting into my friend's car, and I went over to open the door of the passenger seat on the front. The guy who was driving said, no, you sit in the back. The other guy is going to sit in the front. I want him sitting up here. And I was really upset. Why was I upset? Because the front passenger seat is the seat of honor, right? I had to sit in the back. I was relegated to the back. People who were in power would reserve the seat to the right of them. If you're a left-handed person, I'm sorry. But there's always been this discrimination of the majority over the minority. The right-hand seat was always reserved for the most important person. If there was a king, then it would be the next person. If it was perhaps the prince, perhaps the prime minister, whoever it was, the second command was always there, lifted up, given the seat of honor. And in the Bible, it tells us that Jesus ascended to heaven and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father because that is the seat of greatest honor that God has enthroned Jesus. God has actually made Jesus the king of this kingdom. That that is where Jesus is, that Jesus is there, he's reigning and he's ruling. Back in the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7, if you want to check this out, there's a messianic prophecy in which Daniel sees the Messiah, the Son of Man, coming in the air, in the clouds. In this passage is a fulfillment of that prophecy, that Jesus is actually, in Daniel, being presented to God as God's Messiah. And in this passage, Jesus is going to God to be presented as the Messiah. He, has, he is victorious over death, he's risen from the dead, and now he's presented to God and he's seated in this place of dominion and kingship. So really, what scripture tells us is that Jesus is enthroned and he's ruling right now. His spirit is present with us, but he is the promised king and he's on his throne and he is reigning. He is glorified. He's exalted. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. So, if you've ever wondered where Jesus is right now or what he's doing, that's where he is. And what he's doing, one of the things he's doing, is that he is talking to God about you. How about that? What scripture says is that he is interceding for us. He's praying for us, and praying is talking to God. Jesus is talking to God on your behalf. He is saying, I don't know exactly what he's saying, (laughs) but he's advocating for you. That's the word that's used. He's advocating for you, which means, in a way, it's saying, hey, I've done everything that needs to be done for you, for this person. So to God the Father, this person is good. This person is included. This person is part of the family. This person is completely covered by my sacrifice and my forgiveness. This person has received the Holy Spirit. This person is a part of the kingdom. Jesus is there actively advocating with us for God the Father. That's what scripture tells us. Jesus is actively involved in our lives. Jesus is actively involved in your life, your ongoing life. He's interested, and he wants to work through you. The kingdom, the power of the Holy Spirit, the glory of a risen king who is serving and advocating on our behalf. This is all what this passage is 
about. Jesus has done something amazing for all of us in rising from the dead, conquering death, forgiving our sins. But that's not the end of the story. There's a sequel. It goes on. The kingdom of God is happening. It's breaking into this world through the power of the Spirit, through the people called and who have responded and are following Jesus Christ. God has work for each one of us to do in this world, and all of us to do this together as the body of Christ. But we don't do it on our own. We don't do it under our own power. We do it under the authority of our king who is enthroned and glorified, but we also do it in the power of his spirit, which he has given to us to serve him. So like I said, come back next week as we'll continue the story. Let us pray. Lord, your kingdom, which happens through your power in us, all because, Lord Jesus, you are glorified, you are worthy, you are exalted, and all authority has been given to you. Lord, we are your people. We put our trust in you, Lord. Work through us. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in your name. Amen. Dealing with it. Okay, now I'm on. Join with me as we sing and express our, our love to Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you with all my heart. Now time for uh, our prayer for our tithes and offerings and for the congregation. Uh, will you join me in this, in this prayer to God? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for the opportunity once again to come freely to worship you. We remember those who aren't so fortunate, Lord, who have to worship you in secret. 
we continue to ask you seek your blessings as well as those who cannot come out publicly to worship you lord we uh remember those who uh, are suffering now lord we ask for your healing hands upon um, Kara Waddell, who's suffering back pains. Mm -hmm. We ask for your continued strength to minister to those who are in our care. We, we ask that you will st uh, strengthen those who are caring for their parents, for their spouses, for their loved ones. We ask that you will continue to give them strength physically as well as mentally to carry out your your love for them in remembering that uh, that you so sacrificed the most in your in the form of your body and your son who came to die for us lord we pray for this church we pray that you continue to bless us and continue to deepen the fellowship with each member we pray for our nation, that you will give our leaders wisdom as they uh, grapple with the problems of, of that they confront the nation. We pray that you'll can give our leaders wisdom as they try to work out the debt ceiling limit, as well as how to best be the country that you want us to be so we can lead this the world in 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 the ways that uh, that you would want us to lead the world to honor not only you but to honor human life we just ask these things in your son's name you taught us to pray saying father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts our as we forgive our debtors. And may it be a God in the nation. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We chose this song as a song of response to a wonderful Jesus. It's tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take a Jesus. 
Friends, the words of the Apostles' Creed, which some of you are familiar with, one of our most ancient documents of Christian faith going way back to uh, 1,800 years ago, it says this in one of the lines. It says, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. This day of judgment, this some point we don't know whether it's tomorrow, we don't know whether it's a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, we don't know. But we do know that we serve a living and risen Savior, a living and risen Messiah, our King Jesus who reigns for us, for us. Think about that. This is the one whose kingdom we are serving. So friends, today, as you think about this, if you think about what this means for your life, Jesus is with you and Jesus is working through you to bring about his kingdom right in the place where you are. So I invite you to stand now and receive this blessing. As you go from this place, friends, may the love of God our Father, may the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, and may the power of the Holy Spirit be upon each of you, today and tomorrow and forevermore in all things. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.